Welcome back to Bookshops of Arkham. As we begin this chapter, we rejoin our characters. Dr. Hazel Berkovich, Neil Black, Judith Van Horn, and Mickey Sykes. As they emerge triumphant from a mortal battle with the monstrous nature entity and find themselves once more in Hardin's books. The shop has restored itself to its previous form, the towering stacks of moldering books crowding above them. No sign remains of the great and terrible tree, nor the withered corpses of its victims. However, they hold in their hands the items Neil tore from the heart of the tree, a bone knife and a book bound in living bark. Volume One of the Salem Bequest, The Book of the Forest God. Hazel, newly awakened from the spell that bound her, scrambles up from the floor, grabbing her gun and joining her friends as they dash for the exit and pile into the Studebaker parked outside. As Mickey Sykes peels away from the cursed shop, Neil Black, sitting in the back seat, opens the book and begins to leaf through it. Its pages are filled with glyphs and obscene symbols he cannot decipher. And as he gazes at them, he feels his grip on reality begin to waver, become tenuous. He feels the binding, the living bark, lichen and vines, growing, breathing within his hands. Sitting beside him, Hazel sees her closest friend begin to shiver and sweat. She takes the book from his hands and closes it firmly. I'll carry it. If it drives me mad, just send me back to New York. With only one gun and five bullets between them, and grasping the magnitude of what they may be facing, Neil suggests that they could arm themselves more thoroughly by raiding his father's personal armory. They cautiously creep into the home of the Black family, keen to avoid a confrontation with Neil's violent, unpredictable father. And though they are relieved to find that man away, the reason for his absence, a duck hunting trip, means that all of the guns are absent too. All except for a single rifle, which Neil snatches up, even as the resourceful Hazel collects an armful of beer bottles and rags, the makings of Molotov cocktails. With the morning brightening around them, they take stock of the situation and examine their new acquisitions, trying to decide what to do next. It is clearly unwise to delve further into the book of the forest god. Though they may find answers, the risks of even opening it again outweigh the possible gains from trying to decipher those terrible, shifting sigils. Instead, they examine the bone knife. It reminds them of the story they read in Gladys Pinching's book, A Modern Woman's Guide to Mythology, the ancient Sumerian tale of Inanna's descent into the underworld. After Inanna passed through the seven gates of hell and was slaughtered by Ereshkigal, the goddess of death, the great god of the forest, Ninurta, went to Enki, the lord of dark return, to ask him to restore Inanna to life. When Enki refused, Ninurta used his great knife to force the Lord of Dark Return to do his bidding. Mickey turns the knife over in his hands. Could this be it? The bone knife of the forest god? And now, what? The perils that face them if they continue are terrible. But so are the dangers if the books are not found. And if they are to continue on this dire mission, where to go next? There are many bookshops in Arkham. Do they have to search them all? Margaret Jackson's scrawled notes suggested that there are answers in her book, Alignments Through Antiquity, and they have been told that J. Will's bookshop may have a copy. It seems a good place to begin. The afternoon is growing long in Arkham as they drive to J. Will's, and when they draw up outside the little shop, a welcoming, buttery light spills from its sparkling, mullioned windows. Inside, it is warm and cozy, with neatly stocked shelves and low tables of dark, polished wood. At the counter is a very old lady, her face softly crinkled with age and laughter. 
She is gently spooning soup into the still and silent mouth of a much younger woman beside her. The old lady looks up as our players enter, greets them warmly, and introduces herself as Penelope Monarch, the proprietor. Hazel tries to speak to the younger woman, too, but Penelope shakes her head sadly. This is her niece, Martha, who was terribly injured in an accident many years ago, and now she can neither speak nor move. But Penelope will always take care of her. Upon inquiry, Penelope happily provides a copy of Alignments Through Antiquity and offers the four a place to work, a very comfortable parlor toward the back of the little shop. She seems delighted to cater to their every need and brings them a little bowl of peppermints before bustling away to make tea, leaving the catatonic Martha alone at the front counter. As they settle into the soft armchairs around the crackling hearth, they see that on the broad coffee table before them is spread the very thing they've been seeking, a map of Arkham. Judith opens alignments through antiquity to page 94 and begins to read aloud. Though modern astronomy commonly describes the constellation Orion according to the Greek tradition as a mythological hunter, there are many other traditional interpretations of this same grouping of stars. Babylonian astrological lore refers to this same constellation as representing a messenger or gateway to the gods, and in Egyptian legend it depicts an actual god, one who is syncretized with death. When one follows this little trod path further back, there are references in the oldest cuneiform tablets which suggest it is something entirely more significant. Early Sumerians refer to Uru An Na, which can be translated as Light of Heaven, and the three stars on Orion's belt as Sikuru Anu Babu, the key to the gate of heaven. It is thought that in the Sumer city state of Ur, the most important buildings were mapped out in the positions of the stars of Orion, with the holiest forming its belt. As Judith reads this passage, Neil absentmindedly plucks peppermints from the bowl and places them on the map of Arkham, marking each of the locations they have visited so far. A pattern takes shape, for the little candies on the map lie in the positions of the stars in Orion. Everyone leans in as they see that the peppermint marking Hardin's books is the first star on Orion's belt. They look for the other two buildings that will comprise the belt. Surely these will hold the other two volumes. One, which they have not yet visited, is the Old West Church. Not a bookshop, but Neil knows that it houses a private library. And the last, why, the central star on Orion's belt is J. Will's bookshop. The very bookshop in which they currently sit. Suddenly, they hear the bright, tinkling laughter of a child, and the swift figure of a little girl scampers past them, the tail of her bright white cloak flicking around the bookshelf as she disappears. Her footsteps patter away into the distance. They leap to their feet to see where she went, but there is no sign of her, only the distant sound of her laughter. When they turn back to the parlor, they see an extraordinary sight, that of their own sleeping forms, slumped in the comfortable chairs around the hearth. The ground beneath their feet turns red and cracks as the chairs and their forms within them begin to sink into it. The roof above them splits and pulls apart, revealing a great orange sky, lit by the baleful glow of two terrible suns. J. Will's bookshop crumbles around them, disintegrating into red and arid dust, and they find themselves standing alone in the frigid carmine desert of Carcosa. In the distance stands a tiny crooked hut. Its ragged door creaks slightly in the icy wind. Judith takes off at a run towards it, the other players race after her, catching up just as Judith pushes open the little door and steps inside. 
The single room is grim, chill, and dirty. Cobwebs festoon the beams, and the shadowy corners are piled with putrescence, long since desiccated and best not looked at too closely. Beside an empty grate of cold ashes, a cowled figure rocks slowly back and forth in a grimy rocking chair. The door slams shut behind them, and the figure turns to face them, lifting back the filthy cowl to reveal the face of an ancient thing that was once a woman. The sides of her head are caked with blood where her ears once were. Her eyes, too, are gone, and a beetle crawls from one of the empty sockets, tracking black ichor down her withered cheek toward the puckered maw of her mouth, before she sucks it inside and crunches down, her toothless gums making slow, messy work of its destruction. This is Grandmother's house. There are many things I can tell you, but I would like a gift in return. I would like ears that I may hear. I would like eyes that I may see. I would like teeth that I may eat. Would you give me yours? No one is willing to give up their ears, eyes, or teeth to this ancient horror. Grandmother smiles, a beetle's leg still stuck to her cracking lips. Then I will take a tale of love that my heart may beat again. And she opens the front of her shawl to reveal the open cavity of her chest. Inside it crouches the gnarled and blackened knot of her dead heart. Who will tell me a tale of love? Hazel shrugs slightly, glancing to her friends. What harm can come from sharing a memory? And so, Hazel tells the story of her greatest love, Elizabeth, a young woman who she met on her first day as a waitress at a diner in New York. She had found her weeping at the alley door, a stranger to whom she had gave comfort and with whom she ignited a spark of the kind of love Hazel had never expected to find. From that day forward, she loved her, loved her brilliance, loved her kindness. Elizabeth is the very best of her. And now Elizabeth is ill, very ill, and confined to an asylum. Hazel is the only thing that Elizabeth has left, and Hazel will love her always. Elizabeth is the reason for everything she does her reason for living, and the name that will be on her lips as she dies. And as Hazel speaks, the memory slips away. With every word, she forgets a little more, as if the tale is leaving her mind as she tells it, until finally, all memory of Elizabeth is gone, and Hazel collapses distraught and confused. What? What was I talking about? The old woman grins gruesomely and opens her shawl again. Inside the rotting cavern of her chest, her heart, now incongruously young and vibrant red, beats obscenely. Grandmother gives a gleeful chuckle and tumbles from her chair. Like some nightmarish insect, she skitters across the room on all fours and scuttles up the chimney. Suddenly, there is a roaring and a pounding from outside the hut. 
Mickey glances through the window to see the horrific sight of three huge, skinned, and rotting bears tearing at the door. Their peeled flesh blisters in the sun, even as it decays from their bones. Stinking clots of blood flying from their claws as they rip at the frail wood of the hut. Neil helps Hazel to her feet and drags her away from the door, and the four of them scramble to the back wall of the hut. There is nowhere for them to go. No escape from the abominations tearing through the door. As if by miracle, the wall of the hut crumbles behind them, opening a clear path back out into the desert and away. But as they turn to run, they find they can hardly move. Like trying to run in a dream. It's as though they're caught in molasses, burdened by some great invisible weight. And they strain towards freedom as the bears tear through the door behind them. Safety is a breath away, laughing at them, tormenting them, just out of reach. It's Mickey who realizes that it is his coat, grown impossibly heavy, that's holding him fast. He shrugs it from his shoulders and helps the others shed theirs. Their outerwear crashes to the ground as though made of lead, and the four of them break free, fleeing out into the red desert. As they look back and see the hut and the bears fade into dust and nothing, hateful ephemera, Judith realizes what lies ahead on the journey. I think we're each going to have to give something in order to get out. Like Inanna, on her path through the seven gates of hell, they will all have to give. But how much? Another dwelling materializes ahead of them on the parched plain. A house made of candy. Bricks of sweets that have melted like tallow, coated in the desert grit. They approach together and enter. Inside stand two horrible, grinning children. Their sticky hands clasped before a table on which lies the burnt and blackened body of a woman. We want sweeties. But not these sweeties. We're tired of them. We want a story of something sweet. That happened to one of you. Mickey sighs. They're all going to have to offer something. May as well take his turn. He knows, from what happened to Hazel, that this is the last time he will hold this memory. So he takes a moment and allows it to wash over him before he begins to speak. My mother had the voice of an angel. What enough to make them weep. And he tells the children of his mother. How she was hardly around, and when she was, she wasn't exactly caring. She didn't bake cookies, patch up his scraped knees, or kiss him goodnight. But when she sang, her voice was what he called home. As he tells his tale, the children smack their lips. Their tongues, grown hideously long, slither out and lap the air, greedily drinking down the sweetness of Mickey's story. Ah, sweets for the sweet! And Mickey forgets his mother's voice. As Mickey's memory fades, so too to the foul children and the house of candy and the four friends find themselves once more in the red desert. Before them now is a great cliff, its sheer bleak angles broken by the yawning mouth of a cave. There is nowhere to go but on, and so they climb up and step inside. Within the cave, by the light of the glowing lichens on the dripping walls, they find a young man lying on a pile of blankets and furs, his hands neatly folded, his face unnaturally smooth. The top of his head has been neatly cleaved away, and his skull is completely empty, a smooth bowl of polished bone. 
as a great boulder rolls over the mouth of the cave, sealing them in. The young man's eyes open, flat and silver in the darkness, regarding the four people before him. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the wisest of them all? Teach me a lesson, a lesson you learned. Judith makes her offering. She tells the empty-headed princeling of how her father taught her to fish, how to bait the hook, cast a line, reel it in, and then to kill and clean your catch. She speaks of how she would take the eyes of the dead fish and throw them back into the river so that the last thing they would see was home. Her father was a hard man, but, says Judith, But I suppose, in a way, he taught me mercy. The empty-headed prince gazes at her. His lips curl back from pearly teeth. Teach a man to fish, and he will eat your lifetime. The bony chalice of his skull fills with roiling liquid. Within it, the dead eyes of fish bubble to the surface, hissing and melting into the foul fluid as the last of Judith's memory, too, melts away. And the cave fades into nothing around them. Now, the red desert stretches unbroken from horizon to horizon. Nothing can be seen except a single tiny bean lying alone on the parched earth. The soft voice of a woman speaks from nowhere and from everywhere. A drop of liquid is all I need to grow. Spare me a little of that with which you are replete, that which floods your heart and veins. Mickey, without pause, takes his knife and opens a cut on his wrist, allowing the blood to flow freely onto the bean. As he does, it cracks open, roots spilling forth and ripping down into the dry earth, as a great beanstalk erupts forth, racing into the sky, growing wider and mightier by the second, until finally its immensity settles into creaking stillness. In the side of the great beanstalk, a doorway etches itself into being, and the door swings wide. Beyond it, a staircase winds away, up, inside the beanstalk. Neil goes inside and looks up nervously. This, there's a big something up there probably, he says, as they begin to climb. The walls of the tower are inscribed with symbols, glyphs, and sigils. Some Neil recognizes as those he saw in the book of the forest god. Others they saw etched on the skin of Joseph Norris. And yet there are more, unknown and diabolical images that pluck at their sanity as they climb, ever higher, the air growing thin. For hours they climb before finally they reach a little door at the top. Beyond it is a dim room of dying vines. In the corner, the vines have wound themselves into a bed in which lies a shrunken figure. It is Martha, the catatonic young woman from J. Will's bookshop, but now she is very much alert, staring at them with wide, terrified eyes, her skin sallow and sucked back against her bones, her limbs weak and withered. They have taken everything. Mickey races over, slices away the vines that surround her and tries to pull her free. But the vines grow back faster than he can cut them, and Martha is immobilized by dread. From nowhere and from everywhere, that soft voice speaks again. She is afraid. Tell her a bedtime story. A story of 
courage. Resigned, Mickey sits on the edge of the rotting vine bed and tells Martha about his service in the war. The dread monotony of trench warfare, of taking a hill only to lose it and then fight to regain it over and over and over again. But it was in the trenches that he met his company, the best of men, men who would fight for each other, hold on to each other, men who survived that terrible war only to die bad deaths in that godforsaken warehouse right before his eyes. Those bravest of men, he would go up that same hill time and time again for them. They made everything worthwhile. And even as Mickey forgets his comrades, and another piece of who he is is stolen away, Martha appears to grow stronger. The vines fall back, allowing her to stand, as her cheeks fill out and her limbs. A white cloak flows from her shoulders as she steps out onto the red earth of Carcosa's desert, turns and walks away. As she goes, the white of her cloak bleeds through with red until she blends into the landscape and then disappears. In the near distance, three small houses appear, one of straw, one of sticks, and one of stone. Before each house stands a version of Martha, all wear a red cloak, but one is young, no more than sixteen. Another, a mature woman, her belly swollen with child. The third is ancient and bowed, a crone leaning on a stick. All three turn and disappear inside their houses. Judith wonders, Are we the wolf? Or are we being chased by the wolf? None can answer. But Neil approaches the house of straw and knocks. As he does, it crumbles to skirling dust and disappears. He knocks on the door of the house of sticks. Again, it turns to dust. The only one that remains is the house of stone. And when Neil knocks, the door is opened by the youngest Martha who beckons them inside. It is warm, rustic, welcoming. In the wide fireplace, a pot of stew bubbles sumptuously, and above it hangs a great hook, bound of three human rib bones. On either side of the hearth stand the mother and crone Marthas. The maiden joins them. The three Marthas regard their visitors kindly. Which one of you will give? Mickey's frustration is immediate. Give what? I think we've given you enough. I, I got nothing left to give. You have everything to give. One of you must give all. What if we all give some? The Marthas shake their heads in unison. One must give all. Mickey loses his temper. He grasps the elderly Martha by the shoulders, lifts her and impales her on the great bone hook above the hearth. She slides to the floor, the hook slipping through her like butter, leaving her unharmed. He attacks the youngest Martha, trying to pummel her into ash, but she disappears from beneath his hands. He looks up to see her standing with her sisters, they smile at him benignly. Who will give? Neil suddenly steps forward, determined. I'll do it. Hazel hurries to pull him back. Judith and Mickey also try to stop him. All three are aghast at the unknown implications of the gift the Marthas demand. But Neil will not be deterred. Y you've all stepped up. I've done nothing. He turns to the Marthas. What is... All. I'll do it. Whatever it is, I will give all. 
The choice is made, say the Marthas. They encircle Neil, gazing at him gently, and speak the following words. You were lost in the desert, but now you are found. I shall make you warm soup to drink. You were lost in the desert, but now you are found. I shall mend your clothes and keep you warm. You were lost in the desert, but now you are found. I shall carry you in my arms and comfort you. And with that, the youngest Martha places her hands on Neil's shoulders and effortlessly lifts him into the air. She carries him to the hook over the fireplace and impales the back of his head upon the hook. As his friends watch in horror, the other two Marthas take hold of Neil's feet and pull down as the hook pushes through the back of his head and out through his mouth. Neil's body hangs from the hook, blood pouring from his mouth, his eyes, his ears. And Judith, Hazel, and Mickey awaken in the parlor of J. Will's bookshop. It's glamour broken. The room is now dusty and shabby. The fire gone from the hearth, the grate cold and ashen. Neil lies slumped in his chair. Hazel rushes over to him, shakes him, calls his name, tries desperately to wake him. But though there's not a mark upon him, his body is cold. Neil Black is dead. Hollowed out by grief, Hazel looks to the others. He might have been the only friend I had. Before them on the table lies a book, the second volume of the Salem Bequest, The Lullabies of Carcosa. Mickey snatches up the tome, revealing the map of Arkham beneath it with Neil's peppermint constellation of Orion still marking their next destination. The Old West Church. Mickey points at it. Wasn't there something about the third volume offering resurrection, renewal, the Lord of Dark Return? He picks up Neil's body. I'm going to the church. None of you got to come. It's up to you. But I will see this through. The kid gave his life for me. He didn't have to. I'm going to do my damnedest to bring him back. And as the three survivors of Nightmare Carcosa carry the body of their friend out of J. Will's bookshop and make their way to the Old West Church, here we conclude this chapter of Bookshops of Arkham.